back, everybody. Hope you guys had a lovely weekend. It was beautiful out. At least it was in Chicago, so beautiful day today and a great day for us to slow down for a minute. We have some stuff to finish up from last week, particularly polymorphism, which is a topic that we'll continue to look at in the future. So if it's not quite clicking yet, that's okay. Don't uh, be discouraged. We'll see this again and again. We're going to talk a little bit more about polymorphism today with some reminders about um, how we can change the view that we have of a particular type of Java object. And we'll show some of the implications of looking at objects in different ways, right? Looking at an object as a capital O object, right? That gives us, still allows us to do some things with it. Um, but then if we look at it more specifically as the instance of the actual class that we created it as, um, we have some more features that come along with that view. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do today, and then we'll do some problems at the end. So this is kind of a, you know, a slow down, break, object review sort of uh, class. Um, but the first thing I wanna, I wanna just talk about, since I know that people are frustrated, is um, how many people here have been frustrated recently with this class, with the MP? Okay, good. So let me, uh, let me talk about that a little bit. Um, so frustration is a feeling, it's an experience that often accompanies another thing that I want you to experience in this class, which is learning. It's not, it's not easy to learn new things. I was just reading a, um, an interesting study about some experiments that they did in a physics class at Harvard, actually, and what they found was that students' perception of their own learning was actually inversely correlated with how much they were actually learning. And, you know, part of the reason for that, and, you know, I teach class in a somewhat traditional way, you know, I'm up here talking, and I make things sound all easy and nice and crisp and clear, I hope, that's my goal. Um, but then you sit down and you have to do the homework problems or you have to do the MP, and then you might get stuck, you might get frustrated. And, you know, really, again, I just want you to understand, that's a moment where new knowledge is entering your brain. That's a moment where new information is taking root, right? You're building these new mental pathways that are going to be there in the future. Now, I have, so that's the good news, okay? The bad news is, and I hope, you know, as you guys are reading coders, you're getting some sense of this, um, frustration is not something that goes away in this field, in this profession, in this uh, world that you guys are entering into. Uh, this is something that you will still be living with 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Something that I still feel on, you know, a fairly regular basis, um, you know, with my own work, with other things that people do around me, whatever, but specifically this frustration uh, with programs, not being able to get things to work. The sense that it all seemed so easy when I started and then it got hard and ugly and gross and I had to make, do things I didn't want to do to get the system to work I was trying to build or whatever, okay? <laughs> so, why don't we take just a few moments, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, what do you guys do when you feel frustrated? You guys, coping strategies. Anyone share something, you know, when you get frustrated, you just keep going, just feel frustrated? Is there anything you guys do that helps? Yeah. Yeah, so take a break. And that break can be a break from the MP entirely, work on something else. You guys have other classes, do a little bit of homework for something else. You know, write an email to an old friend at home. You know, check social media for 15 minutes. That's okay. But there's another way of taking a break, which is to kind of step back, get yourself out of the immediate problem that you're trying to solve, and try to think a little bit more about kind of what am I trying to accomplish here, right? And is there a better way to approach this? When I was, um, when I was learning how to do this, and so I, I'm, I'm sort of, we'll see how this goes. I'm not sure this is a great story to tell here, but let's, let's see what happens. So one of the uh, first courses I took that really got me hooked on this was a really programming intensive course on computer operating systems. 
And so I used to, I had bad study habits, which I don't encourage you to replicate, but I used to set aside like an entire night each week to work on the assignments for this class, which were known to be extremely time consuming. So I would go down to the programming lab and I would just plan on being there until morning. Again, this is not a good idea, all right? But along the way, I would need to stop and take a break. And so I developed a habit, a bad habit. And I'm not gonna say exactly what it was, since for some of you can probably guess, this is not a good habit to develop. I'm not encouraging you to do this. But the habit that I developed forced me to periodically get up out of my chair, walk up from the basement onto the ground floor, step outside into the fresh air, and be there for like 10 minutes doing this bad thing that you, none of you should do, right? Even if there's new ways to do it that are like cool or whatever, right? No, no, no. Not good. Clearly not good, right? Now we're finding out more about this. So anyway, don't do this. But the break was really helpful. You know, a lot of times I would find myself coming back thinking, okay, you know, it just, it gets you unwedged, right? Now I can, now I can see the problem in a new way. So that's a nice thing to do. Again, don't develop bad habits associated with it. Have a cup of coffee or something. That's a better, better ritual. Make yourself a cup of tea. What else? Anything else that people do to, to deal with this, this feeling of frustration? I'm, you know, one of the reasons we're talking about this is, like I said, just to prepare you for the future, because this doesn't stop. This is not something that ends here. This is something that you're going to continue to experience throughout your life. And so coming up with some good habits and good practices for dealing with it is important. Who else has an idea, a suggestion? There are obviously no wrong answers here. Yeah. Ask for help. Yeah. Post on the forum. Come to office hours. You know, it's much more fun. How many people have realized this semester? It's much more fun to be frustrated with somebody else than it is to be frustrated by yourself. Right? Maybe the person you're frustrated with is a CA. Maybe it's a TA. Maybe it's me if I'm helping you on the forum, whatever, right? Find a frustration buddy. Then it sort of becomes funny sometimes, right? Or at least you have a sense of camaraderie, right? You're not alone in this, you're not alone going through this. And again, one of the reasons I'm spending a few minutes to talk about this today is that this is a feeling that does not stop. So first of all, if you're feeling frustrated from time to time, don't assume that that's because you don't know what you're doing. Don't assume that that's because you're bad at this. This is when you are learning. This is when you are actively learning something. When you're just cruising along and everything's going great, that's when you're applying the stuff you already know. When you get stuck, it means you've encountered something that you don't know how to do. You will learn how to do it. You'll get practice doing it. The first time it'll be hard. The next time it'll be a little bit easier. The time after that, you won't even notice that you did it. Okay. So, let's go back, talk about polymorphism, which we started talking about last time we met, which was last Wednesday. So, in Java's object model, we can, allows us to look at instances of classes in multiple different ways. The term polymorphism is a more general term in programming languages. And the more general definition is this idea of the provision of a single interface to entities of different types. And so what we're looking at, when we look at Java objects and how they can behave in different ways depending on context, is actually an instance of a broader idea that we'll actually see another example of today. You've already seen polymorphism. You just didn't realize what you were looking at. We didn't call it what you were looking at. Now we're gonna go back and look at another instance of polymorphism you're already familiar with. And then in the future, when we talk about generics in like a month or so, you'll see another form of polymorphism that also exists in Java. But let's talk about class-based polymorphism. So remember, even if I don't inherit explicitly from another class, so we looked last week at inheritance relationships with Java objects that I can establish through the extends keyword. And that allows me to inherit the state and behavior from another class. And this is actually really powerful because there's a lot of cases in which multiple classes share similar functionality. And rather than duplicating all of it in class A and class B, 
I can refactor my code so that there's a single class that both of them inherit from that contains all of that common state and behavior that they both need. Then, by inheriting from that class, I can still customize things if I want. I can add new methods and new state, and we also saw last week how if I don't like the way that my parent or one of my ancestors has defined a particular method, I can also override it in my class definition and provide my own implementation that works differently. There are some restrictions about exactly how I can override things, um, but I can still do this, right? So these are, this is, these are sort of a lot of the desirable features of Java's class model. But because of this, every Java object is actually, except one, except capital O object, that every other Java object is really actually can be thought of as an instance of two different types, at least two, potentially more. Whatever type of object we created it as, and then capital O object. So in this particular small um, inheritance relationship that I've established on this slide, I have a class called pet. Pet does not extend explicitly any other class, but that means that it extends capital O object. And then I have a second class called dog that extends pet. So pet adds the print me capability to the class. So pet provides this function called print me that returns no arguments and prints a string to the console. It's kind of a, you know, silly example. And then dog overrides that method. So dog inherits that method from pet. If I didn't provide my own implementation, I would get a method that printed I'm a pet. But I've decided to be more specific about what kind of pet I am, and so I provide an implementation that says I'm a dog. Okay, so here, pet is also an object, and then dog, so pet can be thought of, can be morphed into either a pet or an object. I can treat it as either a pet or an object. A dog actually can morph into three different classes. It can act like a dog, it can act like a pet, and it can also, also act like a capital O object. So Java objects can morph into or be considered as instances of themselves, but also of any of their ancestor classes, all the way up to capital O object. Okay. So what does this mean in practice? Okay, so this is very theoretical up to this point. The last time what we saw is that if you take an object in Java and you want it to morph into another object that it can automatically become, so everything can morph into a capital O object. Every Java object can be treated like a capital O object. Java will do that for you automatically. So this was one of the places last time where we saw something mysterious that we hadn't seen before and didn't understand. Because I have a print anything function here, and I've, I understand what the modifiers mean. It's public static void, so it belongs to the class. It doesn't return any arguments. Anybody can call it. It takes as an argument something of type capital O object called to print. And it calls the to string method on that capital O object. Okay, so so far this is very similar to stuff that we've already seen, except for the fact that the code on line 11 and 12 will actually run. We, we experimented with this last time in the playground. We saw that it works. And that is strange, because Choo Choo is a capital D dog. It's not an object. Ziz, my cat, is a capital P pet. She's also not an object. But I can pass them to a function that takes the capital O object as an argument because Java will automatically morph them into a capital O object because they inherit from objects. And we'll see why this works in a few slides. So again, this will work fine, okay? So I can say, you know, I see, and I see that when I um, so here's the other thing that I want you to notice about this. It's really important. I'm calling toString. The default toString implementation, we remember, produces something that looks like this. It's the name of the class, followed by an at sign, followed by this thing that looks like a memory address or something, just a random sort of hexadecimal string. Dog decided 
you know, whoever wrote the DAW class decided that they didn't like the default two string implementation, and you shouldn't either. It's rarely very useful. So they overwrote it in their class. They provided another implementation of two string that matches the default object one. It has to have the same signature. So it takes no arguments, returns a string. And it's public. And all it does is return the string dog. So here's what's interesting. When these are passed to print anything, they are being upcasted to an object. But when I call to string, which I'm doing in the print anything method, I'm still getting the dog to string implementation when the object that's passed is a dog. So the first time I call this, I pass it with the dog and I get the dog to string implementation. The second time I pass it with the pet, pet hasn't overridden um, to string. If it did, so we can do this, we can say public string to string return I'm a pet. And now you'll see again that I get the overridden to string implementation. Just because I'm treating it like an object, just because it's morphed into an object for the purposes of being able to be passed to this print anything method doesn't mean that Java has forgotten what kind of object it actually is. So again, instances retain their types. When I pass, even if I morph them into another type of Java object, even if I look at them for the purposes of a function as something that's an object, Java still knows that it's a dog, still knows that it's a pet. And so it still can use that to figure out which two-string implementation to use when um, print anything runs. Okay, so, so again, same, same thing here. So here's another way I can do this. And this is gonna make more sense later this week when we talk about object references. But for now, you can think about this as working as follows. On line nine, I create a variable called choo-choo of type dog. I've defined a dog class up here that extends pet, which extends object. So I create a new dog with variable name choo-choo on line nine, on line 10, I, again, which is gonna make more sense later. And I really, you know, again, this is one of those places where there's like a circular reference in Java that you can't get away from. But here, what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, let's create a new variable called choo-choo as object that's of type object. And I'll assign choo-choo to that, and I can do that. So now I have a variable that's of type object. But if I print it, I'm still gonna get the dog print the two-string method, okay? Another thing to, to, uh, another thing that's interesting here is when you call println, you don't have to call to string on the object. It'll do that for you. So I'm just passing an object in. I can also now take choo-choo and look at choo-choo like a pet, at which point um, I can call println on that pet object, but I still, every time I'm doing this, I'm still getting this to string method that's overridden in dog. Because even when I morph my dog object into a pet, which I can do because it extends pet, or into an object, which I can do because it extends a class that extends object, like every Java class. Even when I do this, it's still, Java still remembers that it's a dog. Okay. So essentially, what we're doing here is a form of casting. Remember before, when we cast, we could, we talked about casting uh, different primitive types to each other. So I could take something that's an int and cast it to a double. Just like casting primitive types, there are rules, though, about how I can cast Java objects. So I can always cast Java objects to their ancestors. So a Java object can uh, freely morph into one of its ancestors. So if I take, again, dog, I can treat dog like an object without doing, have, having to do anything special. If I want to downcast an object, so let's say that I have something that's an object, but I know it's actually a dog. Then I need to do more work, because here um, it's, it's not clear that this is something that I can do. It's possible that this is going to be unsafe. So we'll look at an example of this in a minute. So here, now on line nine, on the, so this is another new piece of syntax. So on the right side of line nine, I'm creating a new dog. But on the left side, I'm saving it into an, a variable of type object. So even in this one line of code, I'm doing an upcast. I'm taking something that's actually a dog, and I'm saying I'm gonna work with it as if it's an object. 
I can call print anything on it because it's an object and that's gonna work. Now, if I want to, let's say I want to treat it as a pet. So pet is one of the types of object that a dog can morph into. I have an object variable here, and I want to treat it as a pet. I can't do that automatically. I have to do this explicit cast that you see here on the right side of line 11. And I'll show you why in a minute, because this doesn't always work. Now here, I can do that, because we know that Choo Choo is a dog, dog inherits from pet, so pet is one of the types that uh, Choo Choo can morph into, that dogs can form, morph into, right? So again, this will work okay, right? So I'm gonna print Choo Choo at the beginning as a dog, as an object, then I'm gonna downcast Choo Choo to be a pet on line 11, and now I'm gonna downcast Choo Choo to be a dog on line 13. Okay, so I can do this th through this explicit cast. Where can this go wrong? Who can give me an example that causes this to fail? So I have something that's an object. I know, because I wrote this code, that the object is actually a dog. So I know that it's safe to do that downcast on line 11. I know it's also safe to do the downcast on line 13. But who can give me an example of where this will break, okay? Choo Choo can, Choo Choo is a dog. He's an instance of the class dog. He can behave like a dog. He can behave like a pet. He can behave like an object. Those are the classes that he can morph into. What is one class that we work with sometimes in Java that he cannot morph into? String. Okay, so let's try this. Let's take, let's change line 13. Say, okay, I'm gonna treat Choo Choo like a string, and this will not work. Now I get a, this is a runtime error, okay? This is another one of these errors that you're gonna start to see as we work with polymorphism. This says, this is a class cast exception, and it says dog cannot be cast to a string, right? So I can't, you know, again, there were three different classes that Choo Choo could morph into. He could morph into, he could, he is a dog, he can morph into a pet, and he can act like an object. String's not on that list. So there's no way to take something that's a dog and force it to behave like a string. And, you know, to some degree that makes sense, right? Choo Choo is a dog, he doesn't have an array of characters, so there's really no way for him to behave like a string. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's move on. So, if you want to, so Java provides some features for working with polymorphism and inheritance at runtime to make things like this safe, okay? And you'll see this when we start to do equality methods in Java. We're gonna start to have you guys write equality methods for your Java classes. So how do I determine what an, what, what an object's actual type is? Let's say I just pass you an object, but you know that it's not actually a capital O object, it's something else. Java provides another keyword called instance of that allows you to test whether or not a particular variable is an instance of a particular type of Java class. So here I've got, I've set up my you know, something similar to what we've typically been using when we've been talking about inheritance. I have a dog class, a pet class, and then dog and a cat that extend pet. Now I'm creating two, um, two objects here. One is a dog, the other is a cat. But I'm gonna treat them both like pets. I have two variables that are of type pet. So now the question is, how do I find out more about these? I know one's a dog and I know one's a cat, but what if I pass them to a function that didn't know that? And so I can use this instance of operator to say, is this variable actually an instance of a dog? That'll print true. And I can test it against pet, which will print true, which is obvious, because it's a, I've, I'm treating it like a pet. And then I can, uh, if it's not an instance of that type of object, then I can, then it'll return false. So this allows you to determine whether or not you can, whether or not a particular variable a particular object that you're working with can morph into a certain type of Java class or not. And this allows you to do things safely. So for example, back here, I could say, if Choo Choo instance of string, then and only then, oh, it's gonna get mad at me, 
will I treat Choo Choo like a string? Oh, don't be, don't be so angry. I think this is, is this all just off by one thing? All right, it's angry with me, but I could do this. All right. Uh. So here's an example of that. And again, let's, let's test Choo Choo to see if Choo Choo's a string. This is now going to print false. Oh, I, I think I've used java.line.string. Thing. Ah, okay. Yeah, no, there's something wrong with this example. All right, let's go on. All right. So, so this is something I threw out at the very end of class last time, and I just want to make sure that uh, we get through this because you know we don't have too many opportunities in this class to actually look at theory. Here's one of them. Right, and this is you know, again, this is not only a chance for us to connect a piece of theory about how programming languages work. Uh, but also a chance to recognize, you know, a great living uh, computer scientist. So, there's this principle that Java adheres to, right? That Java's type system and class model adheres to, which is something called substitutability. And the idea is that, again, let's look at this carefully. If S is a subtype of T, okay, so in that, in our world, that means if S extends T, right? S is a subtype of T then objects of type T may be replaced with objects of type S without altering any of the desirable properties of T. Okay, so this is, again, I mean, it, this is a very theoretical definition, so we have to kind of slow down and, and try to make sense of this. So what this says in Java is I have a class that extends another class. I can take objects of the parent and replace them with a class that extends that class. And the goal is that I shouldn't, you know, lose any of the desirable properties of the parent class. And the reason for this in Java is because the classes inherit those features from their parents or their ancestor classes, okay? One of the things that's interesting, so here's an example of this. Everything in Java is an object. And when we talk later in the class about some of the data structures that we're gonna build together, like lists and hash maps and things like that, we're gonna see how there are only a couple of methods that we know that every Java object is going to have because they all inherit from capital O object. ToString is one of them. ToString is one that we use in a lot of examples, but in a practical sense, it doesn't turn out to be useful for that much other than debugging. But there's several other ones. There's equals, there's hash code, and those turn out to be extremely useful. When we talk about hash code, this is going to allow us to build data structures in Java that we can use to store any type of Java object. We don't need to know anything about what we put into this data structure. All we need to know is that it's an object in Java, because every Java object has these features. So this is substitutability in practice. This means that I can, again, I can build a general purpose list Eventually, you know, you guys were upset with the limitations of Java arrays, and I don't blame you. Eventually, later, in a couple of weeks, in a month, we're gonna build our own list, and you guys are gonna start to do some problems working with Java's built-in list classes. Those classes can store any type of Java object. The reason is substitutability. When we talk about maps, right, which is another super useful data structure, those can store in Java, any type of Java object. Again, the reason is substitutability. The reason is that every Java object inherits a small number of desirable features from capital O object. And so I can take capital O object, I can replace it with any other object that inherits from it, which is every one in Java, and I can still maintain those features. So again, this is an instance. When we talked, when we started off the class, we talked about polymorphism, and I said this is, um, this is a design principle that manifests itself in several different ways in Java. There are actually three, I think maybe even four different types of polymorphism in Java. This is something called subtype polymorphism, 
right? We know that every Java object is going to provide to string, even if every Java object can implement it a little bit differently. So there's this, both this guarantee and there's still this flexibility about how exactly I uh, get things to work. Okay. So. On some level, what we're looking at is same name, different behavior. So any Java object I can call to string on. What happens may be determined by the actual type of Java object that I'm calling the method on. We've seen something like this before. Something similar, where the name was the same, but something else about the information that I was passing, you know, when I was uh, you know, writing the code was providing context. So I've seen a case before in Java where I can have the same name for one, two, ten different things, but they could behave differently. You guys remember what that was? Yeah. Yeah, function overriding. Remember this guy? Same name, sum. Potentially different behavior depending on, in this case, what the arguments are. Now, in this case, you know, usually when I use this for functions, I want them to behave similarly, right? If I have two functions called sum, and one actually does a sum, and the other, uh, you know, does a product, then it's confusing. But here, I can write as many different versions of sum as I want, and they can all work differently if I provide them with different arguments. That's how Java distinguishes between them. So this is a second type of polymorphism. So subtype polymorphism, a single method can act on all of, you know, a particular type of class, right? So a single method to string can now be called on every descendant from object. This is method overloading. A method can behave differently depending on the arguments that I provided. And the third type of polymorphism we'll look at Java, in Java is something called generics, which we'll get to towards the end of the class. Okay. Any questions at this point before we do some examples. Yeah. Mm hmm Oh, I, yeah, so, okay, great question. So, no one has ever asked that question before. It's a really good question. So the question was, what's the distinction between overriding and overloading? So at Java, I overload a method by providing multiple implementations with the same name that take different arguments. I override a method that I've inherited from one of my ancestors by providing the same method that takes the same arguments, right? So I can understand why this is confusing, right? Overloading is like, I wanna have five different versions of sum that are all defined in the same class. Overriding is object defined to string, but its implementation isn't very good, and I have more information that I like to provide when someone tries to print me out, I'm gonna over override that method. Now you're gonna confuse me about which one is which, but I'm gonna try to keep it straight. Yeah, great question. Okay, so let's go through some of uh, a couple of the recent homework problems. Uh, we'll do this one quickly, and then we'll spend a few minutes with last 10. Last 10 is like a classic CS125 homework problem, one of my favorites. Um, all right, so here was, so we're, we're getting to the point now in the class, and this is a fun point, right, where from now on, what we're gonna ask you guys to do is, des is be designing classes pretty much here, from here on out. We're about, Halfway through the homework problem, I think. I think this week we started with number 33. I think we go up to like 65 or 66. So we're about halfway done with the homework problems. Um, the class design homework problems. You know, the th one thing I would encourage you to do very, very, you know, um, to how, do, how do you approach these? Read them, right? And literally you can see like bits and pieces of the structure emerge from the description to find a public class named flip. Okay, well, I've got the first line of my code. Public class flip. Takes a single public instance method called flop. Okay, I've got public flop. I don't know what it returns, but it sends returns a Boolean. Okay, public Boolean flop. All right, does it take any arguments? Nope. Okay, so I have another line of my object, right? Um, and then it gives me some information about it, what it does, and then it'll tell you about a constructor, right? So now I need a constructor. It takes a Boolean argument, so capital flop, or is it flip? Capital flip, takes a Boolean argument, sets the initial state of the flip instance. So that also gives me a clue about what the state is that this class needs to store. 
One of the things that we're going to do, and this is gonna frustrate some of you, I get complaints about this for some of the quiz questions that we have coming up. When we give you a problem like this, we will typically not tell you what state you have to store. We will tell you how the object has to behave. But we didn't say here, store a single Boolean as state. You know, that's, that's up to you to figure out, right? Um, with this particular instance, there's the big clue because it says, it takes a Boolean argument that sets the initial state of the flip instance. So there's a strong clue there just in the problem write-up that the initial, that the state that this class is storing has to it consist of at least a Boolean. But in general, we're not gonna tell you how the state of the class has to, has to be set up. That's for you to figure out and for you to design. That's kind of what's fun about these problems, to be honest. If we told you exactly what state to store and how to manipulate it, um, it would pretty much just be like translating the English description into code. All right, so let's do flip, all right? So I've got just a little, I've got some example code here set up that we'll be able to run in a minute. So like I said, I've got public class flip. That comes from define a public class name flip. With the single instance method, the instance method is called flop takes no arguments and returns a boolean, public boolean flop, and let's just, let's just fill this out for now, um, just with a dummy value, right? Now I need a constructor, we have a constructor called flip, this is the syntax of my constructors generally, that constructor should take a boolean argument, I'm gonna call this initial state, and that should set the initial state. So again, now I'm getting a clue that my initial state should be a Boolean. Okay. All right, there we go. So now I've got my constructor that takes a Boolean and sets the initial state. I have a, the class, and now all I need to do is figure out what to do in flop. So it says flop changes the state from false to true or true to false and returns the new, not the old state. So if the class is created with true, the first call to flop should return false. It should change true to false and return the new value. The next call should return true. So this is essentially just toggling things back and forth between true and false. So how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna say, state is equal to, okay. So, you know, you, you could write this differently. This is probably the most, you know, concise way to do it. All right. And then I wrote a little bit of testing code just to kind of try to make sure that things are working, okay. One of the things I would, you know, suggest you to, th that you think about whenever you're doing this type of thing is making sure, and, and you know, when you guys are working on the homework, you can do stuff like this. Use the playground if you want to. It's not a, not a problem. I mean, no, no one, no one cares. I mean, you guys write the code, eventually it has to go into prayer learn, but you can use the playground while you're working to do stuff like this. So each one of these is supposed to act independently. And to test this, I've created two of them. I've created a flip instance called flip that starts out true, and then I've created a flip instance called flop that starts out false. And in each iteration through the loop, I'm calling, I'm printing the result of calling flip.flop first, and then flop.flop. It's a fun, I feel like I'm Dr. Seuss up here. This is a fun problem to try to talk through, okay? So let's just look at one instance for now. Let me comment this out, okay? So the initial state of my flip is true. The first time I call it, it's false, and then it goes back forth between false and true and false and true. Good. Now let's just look at my flop. So its initial state is false, and first time I call it, it's true, and then it's gonna go rotate back and forth between true and true. Why is it important to use two different instances here for testing? What mistake could I made here that would cause me to get in trouble? Remember last week we talked about a particular Java keyword, it's dangerous, makes a big difference in behavior. It's another problem with this Java keyword, which is that sometimes it will, it will make it look 
like things are working. Yeah. Static. All right. So let's see what happens if I've just decided because I just like chaos and mayhem, let's throw a static on here. Hey, it works. It's awesome, okay. So that looks good. Now let's, so my flop looks good. I'm just not edit random parts of my code. Let's look at my flip. Also looks good. I'm good, right? What happens when I look at both of them together? Now I have a problem. So let's look at what happens to my flip. I call flip.flop the first time, um, I already get back the wrong value, right? I'm supposed to get false, I initialize it with true, I'm getting true, and then I get true every time. Okay? Let me, uh, just for fun, let me call flop.flop .flop and not print the result and just show you that this is clearly broken, right? I'm getting the same value back every time. So again, one of the dangerous things about static is that a lot of times it'll make your code look right if there's only one instance of that class. Because as soon as you have two or more, they're sharing that state in ways that cause their behavior to be incorrect. Okay, good. So, that was our little warm up. Now let's do last 10. So I'm not gonna labor here on the definition of last 10. You guys knew, you guys did this, you guys saw the write up. Um, let's just get to work. Okay, so I'm gonna sketch out the bones of this from the description. Okay, I need, oh, nope, come back. I need an add method. And I'm just gonna have that do nothing for now. And I also need a get last 10 method that returns an array, and I'll just return null for now just to get this to compile. Okay. What do I do? So let me, let, let me look at it, let me point out some of the common mistakes that, that people made, okay? So here's one of them. Well, well first of all, sorry, this is flip-flop. Let me go forward. What's, what state do I need here? Now again, we did not tell you what state you needed. But what state does this class need? At minimum, one piece of state that this class has to store. Yeah. An array of integers. I'm gonna be hard pressed to remember 10 integers without an array of 10 integers. So let's put that in there. Let's say, and I'll just, because I'm designing this to hold 10, I'll initialize it to be 10, okay? So here's one thing that, um, that people did. They did something kind of like this. They said, okay, so I'm gonna go through my array I'm gonna say if values i is equal to zero, values i is equal to new value. All right. So essentially, I'm going, what am I doing here? I'm going through my array and I'm looking for a zero. And that's where I'm gonna put the new value that I'm passed. This is a common first attempt, first approach at this problem. Why doesn't it work? Someone who hasn't contributed yet today. What's wrong with this implementation? This could work. It could work in another setting. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, so okay, so there's, the first question is what happens when I get to the end? Let's say I give you 10 non zero values. What happens after that? I don't have a story for that yet. Okay, but, but there's something else wrong about this. This will fail even before I get to 10, yeah. Where in the problem description did it say that I couldn't add zero to the array? I'm allowed to add zero, I can add any integer I want. 
So imagine that the first value I put in is one, so you do the right thing and you put it in the first spot, and then the second value is zero, and your code is still gonna end up doing the right thing, it's still gonna put it in the second spot, index one of the array. But then if I call it again, you're gonna overwrite that value. So there's no value. So here's the problem. You have no way to distinguish between parts of the array that contain valid data and parts that don't. There's no special value that you can stick in to this array that will allow you to figure out, based on the value in that position, whether or not the position is occupied or not, right? You might have got, did anyone get away with this, with the auto grader? You might have been able to get away with it, right? If you chose like a really big value or something like that, right, maybe you would have got lucky, okay? Zero definitely didn't work, right? But maybe you filled your array with like some massive value and auto grader didn't randomly choose that value and so you got lucky, okay? But in general, this is not going to work. So what is this, what is this telling us? This is hinting at something about the problem. If I just have the array, I can't figure out which values in it are okay to overwrite. I essentially don't know what the last 10 values I added to the array are. I can't figure that out just by looking at what's in the array. If I add 10 zeros to the array, then I expect to get 10 zeros out. What do I need here? So again, when we ask you to do these type of class design problems, we're not gonna give you every piece of information. There's something missing here. What is that missing piece? Again, this is the, the, the solution here is totally up to you to design, right? But who, who can give me a step in the right direction? Okay, we're on the right track here. The number, so I'm always adding one number at a time, but I like where you're going with that response. What else do I need? I need another piece of state. What is that gonna store? Yeah. Yeah, so essentially I need to, this class needs to remember where it put the last value. And there's actually two ways to do this problem. One is to remember where you put the last value, and the one is to remember where you're gonna put the next value, right? So those will both work, okay? So in addition to my values, I also need an index. Here, I'm gonna use this index to store the place to put the next value. That starts at zero. That's the first slot I'm gonna use. And then as I go through, I increment this as I go. All right, we're out of time. We can come back and finish this on Wednesday, but probably let's discuss it on the forum. Good luck on this week's quiz. There are questions from Coders Chapter 4 on there. Boo. Um, I will see you guys all on Wednesday. <laughs>